Scott Boras clients are signing at a discount in free agency right now. Could the Mets get back in the mix on Jordan Montgomery or J.D. Martinez? We'll break it all down on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On. That's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers who join today will get $150 in bonus bets. Your first bet of $5 or more wins. Is at fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Now, over the last uh, week and change here, we have seen some Scott Boris clients sign and sign for far less than we ever expected at the beginning of this offseason. First, it was Cody Bellinger, signs a three year, $80 million deal to return to the Chicago Cubs. Now, prior to free agency opening up, a lot of people projected that Cody Bellinger would get $200 million. I know at just baseball, we had an article that went up the beginning of the offseason, projecting contracts, and we've been right on some. We've been low on some. We were way off on Bellinger. We thought he'd get an eight-year, $200 million deal. Well, he gets more than $25 million per, but it's on a short-term deal with multiple opt-outs. Now, this sends Bellinger back into a situation where he's comfortable. It gives him a chance to you know, succeed on this first year, hit free agency, or even come back again, play for $30 million one more time. And then if he has a big year in 2025, he can hit free agency still at a young age and get the long-term deal. And we saw a contract like this work out for Carlos Correa a couple years ago. Another Scott Boris client, if not for the medical records on his ankle, he would have got a $300 plus million deal after getting whatever it was that first year. Was it like $35 million um, in that pillow contract with the Twins? So this has been a strategy that has panned out in the past, but it's not what these guys were hoping for. And we just saw the same thing with Matt Chapman signs a three year, $54 million deal with the giants. He could be there for all three years. He could opt out and maybe get more, but a lot of people thought he'd still get nine figures. There's been some reports out that the blue Jays offered him was like six for one twenty or something like that. A nine figure contract uh, in the middle of last season, he turned it down. Probably regretting that one. So Scott Boris is struggling this offseason. And before we're going to dance on his grave, I do want to note for all of you who think that he just can't get a deal done, wait till next offseason. He's got Corbin Burns, Juan Soto, and Pete Alonso. I think Scott Boris is going to be just fine in the long run. I think this is more a reflection of not only the TV deals and the weird state that free agency is in not Major League Baseball, but it's also the clients that he has, right? Cody Bellinger, Blake Snell, wildly inconsistent throughout their careers. There's been peaks of MVPs and Cy Youngs and valleys of, okay, how much better is this guy than just a slightly above average regular, right? For Bellinger, is he just a two-win player? That's what we saw for a couple of years. For Snell, a guy that can't get past 130 innings. They have great platform years, but there's still that in their not-too-distant past where teams are questioning if they are worth it. Matt Chapman, was the MVP in April last year, and then he fell off a cliff. Jordan Montgomery, we'll talk about more in a minute, sort of pitched above his class. And now he's out for ace-level money when people still view him as a very high-end number three starter. So I think it's more, again, indicative of the type of free agency he had in this class. But now we're looking at these deals, and you could say, hey, the Mets missed the boat on Chapman or Bellinger, but I think... For both of those guys, they went into more ideal situations for them. You know, for Bellinger, he went back to the Cubs. The Mets never could have gotten in on that contract. And for Chapman, he goes back with his old manager, Bob Melvin, San Francisco. Uh, I think he's a Cali kid, so that helps as well. And I think the Mets really want to see what they have in Brett Beatty. And signing Matt Chapman does block that. But when you turn your attention to the starting rotation, what are the Mets looking at this year? 
What prevents them from signing another guy to enter this mix? You got Sean Mania, Luis Severino, Adrian Hauser, you all brought in. Three pitchers who can all be free agents next year. Jose Quintana on the second year of a two-year deal. Tyler McGill is the only guy in the opening day rotation who has a potential long-term future with the Mets, and it's still not even clear if he is a fixture for this rotation. And then you have Kodai Sango, of course, who's on the IL to start the year. So signing a starter does not stop you from seeing some kid get you know, the 15, 20 starts that you want to see this year. A lot of the Mets' top prospects are slated to begin the year and probably spend most of the year still in the minor leagues. So they could absolutely use a starter. Here's the problem. Are you willing to pay the price for a team that maybe you don't believe in? And what does that contract look like on your books long-term? With Blake Snell, it makes sense that the Mets aren't in. Okay, he signed a qualifying offer, so you'd forfeit a second and fifth round draft pick to sign him and a million dollars of international bonus pool money. It now seems like he's open to signing one of these Boris special contracts, the three-year deal, a ton of money on the first year of that contract, and then the opt-outs. And while you'd think that's a bad strategy for Snell because next year's free agent class has been billed as a great one for starting pitching, they're starting to lose some starters that would be available because Zach Wheeler just signed an extension. And man, that's a news item I don't want to discuss. Three years, $126 million, gets just below the Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer average annual value. He's at $42 million per. Phillies going to keep him in their uniform and hopes that he continues to pitch this way and one day maybe even pitches himself into Cooperstown with the Phillies cap, which you might say is outrageous, but the legacy that he's authoring in the postseason, there is a chance that that nightmare scenario happens for Mets fans. So he's off the board. Tyler Glass now is supposed to be part of this class. He signed an extension with the Dodgers. Brandon Woodruff was supposed to be part of this class. He got injured and then signed the two-year deal that would keep him out of free agency. So now you're looking at this class, and yes, you still got Corbin Burns atop. You got Max Freed. You got Shane Bieber, Walker Bueller. But to say that if Blake Snell has something close to of the season that he just had, if you put up even 80% of his Cy Young campaign, he'd probably be a top three starting pitcher in next year's class. So you're basically, if you're signing Snell, looking at a one-year deal and giving up all of that other stuff on top of it, not to mention if he gets $35 million, when it comes to paying 110 cents on the dollar, which is where the Mets are at with all of their spending at this point due to the luxury tax, it's north of $70 million. It's $73.5 million for an average annual value contract of $30 million per. So that's a ton of money for a guy that could opt out and you lose all of that for one year where your chances are still pretty slim to even make the playoffs. But that brings me to Jordan Montgomery. He's hanging out in this market a long time. I have seen a lot of uh, you know, the listeners of this show, the Locked On Mets insiders who have been texting me asking, can the Mets get in on Jordan Montgomery on a three-year deal, one of these short-term contracts? Personally, I say no. And the reason I say no is let's just say it's $25 million per. That counts as $52.5 million. Now, you don't have the qualifying offer to worry about, so no draft picks will be given up. If you hold on to Montgomery for the year, you actually would get a chance to extend him the qualifying offer if he opted out of the contract. And you could get draft picks in return. But that is still a lot of money on an average annual value basis for a guy that could eat into your spending next year. If you give him $26 million per on a three-year deal, well, maybe that prohibits you from signing a Corbin Burns in the following offseason or a Juan Soto. We'll get to that a little bit more in the next segment as I break down the number that makes sense to me. Ultimately, I believe if the New York Mets are going to sign anyone, Jordan Montgomery does make the most sense, and I think it's actually a long-term deal that would make sense for both sides, where you sign him for seven years maybe, you give him an opt-out still after the third year, but not after the first or second year. So you're giving him a long-term secure contract a lot of guaranteed money, but you have him for the next three seasons to be your number two. And, you know, you insure him at a price point that allows you to get the ace in free agency, whether it's next year or the year beyond. So I want to talk about what that looks like a little bit more, the exact dollar amount 
that I think the Mets should offer a Jordan Montgomery and why he could take it. Um, and, and then we'll also get into if that's even worth it or if the Mets should just stand pat. So we'll talk about that from both sides in the next segment. Before we close out the show talking J.D. Martinez in the final segment, but first, before any of it, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Testing your skills on Prize Picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because if you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 in just a few taps. They have quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types which is what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app where it is daily fantasy sports made easy. You can pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Right now, you can look at MLB season stats by finding the MLB season tab. That's MLB S Z N, where you can look at RBIs, for example. You'll find Pete Alonso listed at 108.5. You just pick more or less on that stat. If you think Pete's going to drive in 110 this year, you go more. Matt Olson's at 109 and a half in that lineup. The dude drove in 150 runs last year. Take more. Uh, Juan Soto, more or less on 103 and a half. Again, I'm liking more. Mike Trout, 94 and a half. Is he going to stay healthy? Is he going to have runners to drive in in Anaheim? I take less there. You can combine all those and at the end of the season, win big. All you got to do to start playing is download the app, use the code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, download the app today, use the code locked on for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Head over to prize picks today. Now, the longer that Jordan Montgomery sits on the free agent market, the better deal you could potentially get by signing him to that long-term contract. And what I'm curious about right now is what offers are on the table for Jordan Montgomery. How many teams have offered him a contract beyond five years? At what dollar amount have those contracts come in? And I'm not privy to that information, but I am curious where his market is at right now. Because as much as you can say, hey, go sign that short-term three-year deal with the opt-outs, is there a team that's out there that wants to give him $26 million? Because the one team that seems to be interested, the Boston Red Sox, they're up against the luxury tax and they're super concerned about spending. I don't know if they're going to want to go in and you know put forth a high AAV offer. And if I'm Jordan Montgomery, is that the type of contract I'm looking to accept? A three-year deal, let's just say it pays him $78 million which is $26 million per. Do you want that or do you want $120 or $130 million guaranteed? And the chance to be on an MLB contract for you know, seven seasons, the rest of your career being all set in stone. I think there is a big benefit to that long-term security. Now, as a listener of this show, as a Mets fan, you might think it's crazy to give Jordan Montgomery a seven-year deal. Patently absurd. But I'm wondering what that price tag would be. Let's just say it's $140 million, $20 million per. Yeah, it's probably richer than I would go. Maybe $120 for six years, that's a little more reasonable. But the reason why I say seven years for Jordan Montgomery is let's just say he doesn't have any nine-figure deals on the table. And you can throw seven for 115 in front of him. And maybe he bites at that. Well, now you're looking at an average annual value of $16.4 million. Let's say that he needs to get more than that. Let's say it's $120 million instead over a seven-year deal. Now you're looking at you know a shade above $17 million per year. And the line that I would draw on the sand is, is how much I'd be willing to see the Mets spend on Montgomery. Let's say it's $130 million over a seven-year deal. You're looking at $18.5 million, maybe closer to $18.6 million per season for Jordan Montgomery. This day and age for a number two or a number three starter, that is fair value on an average annual basis. They're asking him to be that pitcher for seven years. That's where the risk comes into play. But if you're looking at the short-term you know, plans for the Mets for 2024, 2025, 2026, that money would be well spent on Jordan Montgomery at that price. 
18.57 million. Uh, that's what that would break down to. If you look at the luxury tax penalties, that's a $39 million commitment for this year for Steve Cohen. It's certainly a lot more feasible than paying over 50. The Mets for 2025, if you look at their luxury tax payroll, and I don't think this factors in arbitration, guys. So that number can certainly climb a little bit more. But if you go to Spot Track, it's sitting at 160 million. The luxury tax threshold next year is at 241 million. So let's just say on the lowest end, the Mets have $80 million to play with going into next offseason. If you sign Pete Alonso and Corbin Burns, and Pete gets $25 million per and Burns gets $35, that's $60 million. Jordan Montgomery gets $26 million. Those three players alone push you way north of that luxury tax. If Jordan Montgomery is getting $18.5 million, well, all of a sudden, you probably come in just under. Obviously, there's other signings to make. There's different tiers of that threshold, but the point is, having an extra $7, $8 million to play with when it comes to average annual value, that could be very beneficial to the Mets over the next couple of years. And then you can still bake in an opt-out. So if Jordan Montgomery is awesome for three years, he can opt out, he can sign elsewhere, and you don't even have to worry about the back end of that contract. But guaranteeing the years for a guy that's been as durable as Montgomery has been over the last few years, who I think will age pretty well, I wouldn't be as concerned about that when you can really think about the value he'll bring in 2024, 2025, 2026, maybe even 2027. If in 2028 through 2030, you're paying a bloated contract, sort of is what it is, but I think you'd get more than enough value on the front end. And when you think about next year's free agency, if you have Montgomery and Senga in place, all right, go get your ace. And this team is ready to roll again to try to be a World Series contender. If you don't do this and you let this opportunity pass you by, you might have to pay way more to address your rotation next offseason. And it's a top-heavy class, but it falls off beyond that. I don't know if the Mets are going to sign two of the top four free agents in Burns, Freed, Bieber, Bueller. So your best bet or your best hope is probably only one of those guys. And unless you get a real breakout from Tyler McGill, David Peterson returns to form, some of the top prospects come up, you might have a very thin rotation once again in a year where the Mets are supposed to be back in the mix to go for it. And this might be your chance to solidify a long-term fixture in that rotation at an average annual value that makes a ton of sense for a repeat tax offender team. So I just think the Mets should at least explore that option because, hey, maybe no one else has given them more than $100 million, and you can find yourself in a situation where it's, like I said, $115 million seven-year deal, opt that after year three, where that average annual value is a little over $16 million, and you're really cooking with gas. So we'll see if the Mets ever explore this or they just sort of let this opportunity pass them by. But they could sort of split the middle and avoid the starting pitching market, but at least get a bat that would help their lineup day in and day out in J.D. Martinez. We've talked about him plenty, but we're going to do it one last time before he potentially signs. I promise I'll go through J.D. Martinez and whether the Mets would reconsider signing him depending on where that price tag gets. So we'll go through what that could look like in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. It's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all of your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. And right now, you got MLB futures available at FanDuel so you can bet on the Mets over under a win total of 81 and a half. You can bet on Pete Alonso's over under home run total of 41 and a half. You can bet on their chances of winning the World Series at plus 5,000, or you can just look at other teams entirely and avoid the Mets because you just don't have faith in them this season. All of that is available for you over at FanDuel. And again, you place that $5 money line bet and you win $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner 
of the NBA. If you're an everyday listener to the show and you don't want to miss out on any of your bonus Locked On Mets coverage throughout the season, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where I can send you updates anytime something breaks on the Mets. It's where you can ask me questions anytime. It's where we'll be sending out lineup graphics throughout the season so you'll get the Mets starting nine before every regular season game. And it's also where we're running our giveaways throughout the year as well. So if you want to be part of all this bonus Locked On Mets coverage, you can find the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash locked on Mets. All right. JD Martinez has been a long, long standing topic on this show, a long standing debate. Do you sign a DH? Do you play the kids? We have discussed it at nausea. But here he is, where in March he is still a free agent. And the one team that we know who offered him a contract was the San Francisco Giants, who have now signed Jorge Soler to fill that spot. And they also got Matt Chapman. They offered him a one-year, $14 million deal that he turned down. He wanted $20 million, but also it would make sense that J.D. Martinez would not want to hit in that ballpark. It's a tough place to go into work every single day in San Francisco. The New York Mets have a much more hitter-friendly park compared to San Francisco, and they might have a more hitter-friendly lineup for a J.D. Martinez. Guy that wants to drive and runs, hit behind Pete Alonzo, Francisco Lindor, Brandon Nemo. Could be a lot of fun. I think when you look at the options that are available, and I did an entire show on J.D. Martinez, I encourage you to go back and and listen to that one or watch it, uh, where I went through every single option that was in front of him, all 30 teams. And the two that I settled on were the Angels and the Mets as the most likely landing spots. And why exactly would you want to play with the Angels right now other than the weather and Mike Trout and even then? As much as people can be down on the Mets, it'd be hard to say that the Angels have a better chance at making the playoffs than the New York Mets. So with all that said, if the Mets put forth a serious offer, I think you could get a a deal done for sure here. Let's say the Mets offer that same $14 million. Are you sure he's not going to take it on a one-year deal? And with that too, you can incentivize him. Throw in a trade bonus. A fat one. Hey, play great. If we're not in the mix, we'll trade you to a contender and you're going to get $2 million. Put in incentives, whatever you got to do. But I think the bottom line is just if you're willing to commit to them on a market value one-year deal, I think they can easily get this thing done. And J.D. Martinez in the Mets lineup, it would make them so much better. Now, the downside of it, the reasons why you don't do it, One, you just are dying to see what you have in Beatty and Vientos. And I do get that pull. I I understand why you would really want to know about both of those guys. But I still believe that you could find a way to get playing time for all three of them. J.D. Martinez, probably going to play 150 games. Beatty, Vientos, they can platoon at third base. You can get Vientos in the game a couple of times when J.D. needs a day. Pete Alonso needs a day. There's a way that everyone gets their time. And also, I think you just look at the cost of acquisition for Steve Cohen. Just money. Blocking Mark Vientos, maybe, but long term, I don't think it's hurting your franchise too much to make that move. And the impact that another 100 RBI guy could mean to this lineup, I feel like you really have to think hard about it. A month ago, the Giants didn't have Jorge Soler or Matt Chapman. They waited out this market. They submitted some offers. They got some free agent signings at relative discounts. And now those two could be the best two players on that team this year, quite honestly. Could absolutely be the result of all this. And Soler and Chapman could be the reason the Giants end up in the playoffs. Cubs able to get their guy in Bellinger. Patience is paying off for a lot of these teams. And this could be the time to get some good deals. So yeah, it might cost Steve Cohen some money. But if tomorrow you told me that Jordan Montgomery and J.D. Martinez were both in the New York Mets, you address your rotation, you got another big bat in your lineup, all of a sudden, the chance that the Mets actually make the playoffs this year, they get so much better. But the Mets do nothing. I think they're showing their hand as far as their expectations of this team. 
it would indicate for one that they don't believe in Jordan Montgomery long term, but two, it would you know clearly indicate that this is every bit of a rebuilding year. Yes, they're going to try to put some talent on the field to maybe surprise some people, but it's more about seeing what you have in the young players, knowing that 2025, 2026, those are the years that you really want to aggressively spend. And this is a time to lick your wounds a little bit off of some you know, really big pushes the Mets have made financially. And they're still going to get hammered by taxes. But to add in $75 million for two players that aren't great, they're just good, I, I can totally understand why the Mets wouldn't and probably won't do this. But when you think about the impact that those two free agents could have on the Mets' chances this year, it is a very tough pill to swallow for Mets fans that this owner who has promised spending and has delivered is all of a sudden being a little more cautious with that checkbook. It is a very unfair bar that Cohen has set for himself. And it has led to fans being disappointed this offseason. But in the long run, All of that could still be the right decision for this franchise. And we might in in a couple of years say, I'm glad they didn't make any of these moves. But at the price tag that these two free agents are at right now, if it was my money or, you know, my team to run, I'd be pretty interested in making this roster significantly better just by spending for this upcoming season. Uh, Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. Want to find any of my work? Follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we are pretty much there, hitting our goal of 8,000 subs by opening day. So I appreciate all of you who have subscribed. You can follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day and your first watch. Now you can head over to Locked On Sports today on YouTube for your second watch and check out the first ever 24/7 streaming channel on YouTube that covers everything in the world of sports with our local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. Find Locked On Sports Today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.